To begin, first we discuss the electrification process that is essential in the generation of lightning. Electrification generates a charge difference between the upper and lower areas of a thundercloud. This happens due to the precipitates known as grapples forming inside the cloud and dropping from the higher to lower altitudes. As they fall, the grapples collide with the other precipitates, inducing a loss of positive charge within the grapple as it is transferred to the other precipitates. Thus, causing a charge difference in the thundercloud between the upper and lower altitudes with a positive charge and negative charge, respectively. We simulate the system numerically using an electric circuit model consisting of a system of resistors and batteries to represent the L column, thundercloud, and electric charges. The distribution of charges are represented by three batteries with fixed voltages and the L column by resistors. The locations of the positive, negative, and pocket positive batteries are shown by this figure. The resistance of each resistor are calculated from the conductivity model of the atmosphere, and thereby we have a good estimate of the resistivity varying with altitude. In our model, we start with 10 resistors to represent a 1D L column of 2 km. In conclusion for case 1, where the second battery, the pocket positive, is set to be 0, the initial discharge T0 is at resistor 4, same with the second time step T1. In the following time steps, the discharge proves the sequence of resistor 3, 1, 2, and 6, and it dissipates in the higher altitudes. For case 2, where we remove the negatively charged battery, the resulting sequence of lightning discharge is R1, R4, R3, R2, R5, and it dissipates in the higher altitudes. Visualizing spatial temporal weather data from geographically separated weather stations. The agriculture sector is vulnerable to climate variability, which necessitates the development of reliable forecasting. Reliable forecasts of daily weather can help farmers and policymakers in making informed decisions that can benefit the economy of the country and minimize food security risks. Recently, machine learning approaches garnered popularity for climate forecasting due to the nonlinear nature of climate data. In this preliminary work, our main objective is to visualize spatially correlated weather stations using machine learning techniques. Specifically, we aim to generate picture space per weather station, cluster weather stations per time window, and identify trackable clusters. To achieve this, we downloaded daily historical weather data from 59 weather stations for the years 2008 to 2019. Mean imputation was used to fill the missing values and the time series data was divided into a time window of four years. Next, cross-correlation between different combination of weather variables were computed per time window. And last, we used chain means and agglomerative hierarchical clustering to obtain clusters from the generated picture space. So here, shown in the figure is a heat map of the correlation of different combinations of two weather variables. And the top three correlated variables are temperature, humidity, and dew point. These variables were used to generate the picture space. So the generated picture space was used as input in the clustering methods, and it resulted to four to six clusters in different time window. Here is the equation for the continuity criterion. In other words, to identify the trackable clusters, Clusters at each time window that share at least 50% were considered as trackable. This ensures continuity in the time windows. So here are the clusters generated, which are trackable. Cluster 1, cluster 3, and cluster 3. In conclusion, our preliminary work shows that temperature, humidity, and dew point are spatially correlated variables. And we generated three spatially correlated clusters based on our continuity criterion. And our future work will involve the evaluation of the correlation of the spatially correlated clusters based on geographical characteristics specific to the weather stations. Steady state thermal hydraulic city analysis of the planned 250 kilowatt research reactor using the Mars KS code. The DOST PNRI is implementing a project to use the PRR1 trigger nuclear fuel as a critical reactor for training, education, and research. 
However, although a subcritical reactor is a valuable training and research facility, it offers limited industrial applications. To potentially reap more benefits, ENRI is also investigating the feasibility of converting the zero power reactor to a low power reactor in the future. In this work, the thermal hydraulics behavior of a 250 kilowatt low power configuration of the PRR1 trigger reactor is investigated using the Mars KS scope. At this power level, the fuel center line or the hottest region of the fuel was determined to have 236 degrees Celsius temperature during steady state conditions. This temperature is well below the 749 degrees Celsius temperature limit of trigger fuel that will result in excessive swelling. The peak heat flux occurs at the actual centers of the fuel run, where the DNDR of 6.18 is minimum at this location. Moreover, the maximum fuel temperature is found to be insensitive to variations in coolant velocity, which ranges from 0 0.2 to 0 0.26 meter per second. Based on the Bernat critical heat flux correlation, coolant velocities below 0 0.2 meter per second will still yield a DNDR above 5. These results demonstrate that a 250 kilowatt ERR1 trigger reactor operating under steady state conditions is capable of safely removing the heat generated in the fuel. Hello everyone, I am Vini Daha. On behalf of my colleagues Brian and Basti from AAM's Access Lab, I will be presenting our project entitled Forecasting Models for Water Dam Levels Using Machine Learning, a collaboration with DOST and Manila Water. About a year and a half ago, Metro Manila went through a water shortage crisis. People from all over the metro lined up for water after services were interrupted on a rotating basis. In this project, we use several machine learning models to forecast the water levels of Angat, Ipo, and La Mesa Dams, the main sources of Metro Manila's water supply. Apart from the historical dam levels as the main predictor, we also include rainfall and ONI as exogenous variables. We compare three ML models, ARIMA, GPM, and LSTM, a type of deep neural network. As a baseline, we use a seasonal naive forecasting method. We then implement a time series cross-validation approach to have a robust model evaluation using the expected value of the mean absolute error. For each dam, six different prediction horizons were considered to enable both short-term interventions and long-term planning. Here are the results for Angat Dam. For a given prediction horizon, the lowest MAE is highlighted in dark blue while the second lowest MAE is highlighted in light blue. We see that GBM performs consistently well in all prediction horizons. Also, IREMA is best for short term, while LSTM also does well for long term. Here are the results for Ipa Dam and La Mesa Dam. We see that in both dams, IREMA and GBM both perform consistently well. In addition, LSTM again does well for long term. In summary, we have the following. GBM is the top performer overall. LSTM does well for long term, while IREMA does well for short term. Then. For each dam and prediction horizon combination, an ML model beats the baseline. Finally, ML models can be used to aid short-term interventions and long-term planning. Thank you. I'm Zachary Borromeo, and my paper is entitled Political Ads and Word of Mouth Modeling the Influence of Filipino Electorate Using SIS Information Epidemics Approach. Political ads and word of mouth are two major factors that shape a Filipino voter's choice. Aside from the spread of common flu, the SIS epidemic model can also be used to describe the spread of information about the candidate in a physical social network. Many election models have been developed, but few exist in Philippine setting. Thus, our aim is to construct said SIS epidemic model extended to cellular automata to explore how exposure to political ads and interaction with neighbors influence Filipino voters' choice. For our methodology, each of the 10,000 voters in a cellular automata is characterized based on age and highest educational attainment 
whose proportions are from COMELEC and PSA data. Each voter has either of the two states, susceptible and infected, where the infected are those who vote for the candidate. In each day, each voter state evolves according to these two values, the P sub N and P sub SUS, where the values for daily mass media exposure probability and daily contact probability fit the Philippine setting. Here are the key results. The graph showing the number of infected voters versus time depicts the SIS model. If only political ads are present, the final number of infected voters at campaign deadline decreases. This shows how crucial word of mouth is in an election campaign. The influence of political ads and word of mouth depends on the age and highest educational attainment of the voter. Consequently, although the model has successfully been created, influence are recommended such as inclusion of other factors like campaign promise in a two-man election. Thanks for listening. The Egyptian model is one of the more important models for human mobility. It basically says that a migrant prefers to move to areas with more economic opportunities, but they prefer to move somewhere closer to where they originally are. They also look at the neighbors of a locality before they move into that locality. And all of this can be summarized by this equation. If you look at this, there's nothing here that says anything about uh, economic opportunities or jobs. Rather, you only, only see population. In the original paper, they use population as the proxy for jobs, which leads us to the question, is it valid to use population as proxy for jobs in a developing country like the Philippines where there's a huge socioeconomic inequality? Can we use amenity counts? That is the number of schools, number of uh, offices, number of uh, government buildings in a locality as a proxy for attractiveness? We so to answer these questions, and to do so, we introduce a generalized aggregation model. Basically, it's a weighted sum of the population of population density and the individual amenity counts. We use this index instead of population in the original equation earlier. So what to define? So we will I will share three main results. First is we found that there's a 7.7% improvement in the BOSS model MAPE, relative to the Asian model. But more importantly, we found that the best model actually just uses amenity counts. Therefore, we don't really need population or population density to model mobility. Interestingly, the most important features are not obviously directly related to jobs. So manually selecting features is not that easy. We found that the generalization model that we introduced is in fact more accurate and more interpretable than the Asian model. Thank you for viewing. And I look forward to the session to answer your question. Hi, I'm Felix from Access at AIM. I'm here to talk about highway traffic effects on an intercity transport loop. Developing cities need robust city transport. This is especially critical for those traversed by a major highway where vehicles on long haul trips interact with within city public transport. Our friends in Kauai City have this issue. We want to avoid mistakes made by other cities way back. And for that, among the things we want to answer is, how do within city and highway transport flows interact? To find this, we perform tricycle traffic simulations on Kauai City's road network. Tricycles start out from the market terminal and go to the city hall and then loop back to the market terminal, passing through a two-lane street on the way. Meanwhile, the heaviness of car traffic at the national highway is given by the variable P, which we let vary across simulations from very light to heavy. We plotted fundamental diagrams for each location P. For light highway flows, we observe typical behavior in two locations and mostly free flow in the others. For medium highway flow, its effects, particularly from jam induced blockage and rerouting, begin to set in. And finally, for heavy traffic, due to severe congestion at the national highway, fewer tricycles get to pass across the board. Now to answer the question of interaction between within city and Long haul traffic flows, we observed shifts in intracity flow involving various mechanisms. 
However, it seems like other quantities such as critical density aren't affected. We're actually doing further research on this front as parts of the DOST Fisheries project titled Platform for Assessment and Tracking of Urbanization Related Opportunities. Thank you very much for your time. Good day, I am Tristan de Guzman and along with my co-author Francis Paraan, we will be presenting about how we will generate text using recurrent neural networks with long short-term memory and evaluate the model's performance. LSTM cells feature memory cell states so that the model can achieve correlations within the sequence. This architecture will be less susceptible to the vanishing gradients during training which can cause failure. LSTMs are available in several machine learning toolkits like the Keras API. Recurrent neural networks or RNNs are trained on sequential data to generate similar sequences. In our case, we train our RNN on text from Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass to generate sequences of text. We constructed one-layer and two-layer models and studied the impact of activating the stateful parameter on the performance of the model. In the stateful implementation of LSTM, internal state parameters within a stochastic gradient descent batch are carried over to the subsequent batch. Doing so can allow the model to learn correlations along the text sequence. We tested our models on 10 random seed sequences and measured the fraction of valid dictionary words in the generated text. We see that the two-layer models both showed an improvement in performance, and this improvement comes at the cost of a more complex architecture with longer training and evaluation times. The one-layer stateless model was able to spell words that are less than five characters long, and the stateful model was able to spell longer words. And it's also noted that the stateless model encountered a loop in seven out of the 10 runs. The four models were able to generate text with varying levels of success, which also showed that a multi-layered model can give better results in terms of dictionary rate at the cost of longer training times. We see that proof of principal text generator can be easily achieved in an educational or home setting. The current state of the art text generator is OpenAI's GPT-3 transformer model, which can generate paragraphs of text that are nearly indistinguishable from text composed by humans. And this will require industrial grade compute facilities while R&D and production-grade generators will require exceptional models and resources. That ends our presentation, and thank you. Good day, I'm Ananda Ntora. Along with my co-author, Francis Peran, I will talk about how we assess the performance of a convolutional autoencoder trained to filter Gaussian noise from images of primitive digits. When you capture an image, there is usually noise added during the image processing. This noise corrupts the original information stored in the image. In this presentation, we will use a simple autoencoder architecture to clean up images of finite digits with Gaussian noise of varying strength. And we will quantify the performance of the autoencoder using the metrics of Linfoot's criteria with respect to noise strength. The data set we use is MNIST finite digits images. We normalized the pixel values and Gaussian noise was added with varying noise strength using a NumPy function, and pixel values are put from 0 to 1. The other encoder is composed of an encoder and a decoder, wherein the encoder unit has two convolution layers, each followed by a max pooling layer, so that it produces a compressed static space representation. In this downsampling process, the noisy features of the image are filtered out. While the decoder unit has two convolution layers, but this time each is followed by upsampling layers that decompresses the image back to its original image size. We added noise of varying intensity to the images, and the results show that the other encoder only removes the noise successfully at a noise strength of less than 0.5 where the digit is still discernible. It can be seen in the image on the right that beyond the set value, the reconstruction process starts to degrade. To quantify the performance of the autoencoder in the noise of the images, we use the input criteria. The fidelity quantifies the overall similarity between the original and reconstructed image shown by the blue curve at the bottom, while the structural content measures the sharpness between the two images shown by the green curve at the top. Lastly, the correlation quality compares how well the intensity peaks of the two images align with each other shown by the black curve in the middle. A perfect construction of an image is when the fidelity, structural content, and correlation quality are all equal to 1. It can be seen with the three methods we can deviate from the ideal value of 1 as the noise strength increases. For this study, the optimum noise strength is from 0 to around 0 0.5 for an nearly perfect construction. Well, thank you.